Hey guys, welcome to my 100 speed black and white film guide. In this guide, I will be comparing every 100-ish speed black and white film which is actively being produced and readily available in the US market in mid-2018 with the goal to help those of you who are new to film photography figure out a film which might be the right fit for you. While this guide is probably going to be most helpful for beginner photographers, I'm hopeful that more experienced film shooters will also find this guide valuable and interesting. Due to the nature and scope of what we're tackling here, this isn't going to be a super short video. So here are some timestamps to help you navigate to the portions that you might find most interesting. As I get into this, you should know that I'm a film enthusiast, but not an expert. There are probably people more qualified to do this, but no one really has, or at least not back to back in a comparison fashion like I'm going to do. With that in mind, I'm going to do the best I can, and I appreciate patience from those who are more experienced. This is as scientific a study as I can possibly make given the limited time, experience, knowledge, and resources, but it's still not super scientific. With any blind test or study like this, there are these things called compounding variables. And in my comparison, there are, there are going to be an untenable number of compounding variables, which can skew the results. For instance, the way any of these films look, both grain, contrast, sharpness, tonality, and etc., can be drastically affected by your choice of developer, your development technique, and your scanning technique. But the good news here is that within reason, you can use just about any combination of films, developer scanning, and post-process techniques to achieve results that you're very pleased with if you're willing to experiment long enough. And any experienced film photographer would tell you that that's exactly what you should do. Pick a film and a developer that works best for your budget and workflow and start experimenting. But since we all need a place to start, I'm hoping this guide will give you a point of departure. If it sparks an interest in a specific film or introduces you to a film you've never tried but decide you'd like to try, to me that makes the whole thing worth it. Now since I'm going to conduct this comparison with 120 or medium format film, 35 millimeter shooters are probably going to want to know if if you can get similar results. And in general, yes, you will be able to. So across the board, when viewing medium format scans at the same effective size as the 35 millimeter scan, since we're dealing with a lot more resolution with those 120 scans, the film is going to be more dense. As a result, 120 shots will appear more sharp and the grain is more tightly packed than the 35 millimeter side of things. So let's talk about how I did this. For the blind test and just to compare the quality of films in general, I wanted to make as many identical or similar shots as possible with each of the seven emulsions we'll be looking at. Shooting with a medium format camera like the Bronica ETRSI works out amazingly well for this as it's just a matter of loading each film into a different back or cartridge and swapping them out at each location and each unique shot. The reason I chose the Bronica ETRSI was because the backs for these guys are plentiful on eBay and are the cheapest backs you can get for medium format devices. To develop the film, I partnered with the awesome folks at Indie Film Labs. Now, as I mentioned before about compounding variables, film developer choice is a huge decision when it comes to the end resulting look of a film. Not to mention mixtures and developing times. For this study, Indie Film Labs stuck with one developer, Kodak Tmax developer, and used Triax development time times from the massive dev chart. They processed all of them using Refrema Dip and Dug processor. For many of these films, people will argue that other development times would be better to start out with, and I'm not disagreeing with that. But again, we had to start somewhere and we certainly can't test all of them. As far as scanning, Indie Film Labs used their Norutsu scanner with a very flat, consistent profile to ensure that the scans were as true to the film rendering as possible. I just wanna say again how appreciative I am for these guys helping out with this. A study like this is not cheap for me to make and their partnership made this possible. You'll find a link to them below and they are awesomely offering us a 20% discount code for development and scanning. So thanks guys. All right, I think that about covers the methodology used. Let's move on to the funnest part of this guide, the blind test. As I mentioned earlier, I took seven different ETRSI backs, each with a different film stock and shot in many different situations, trying to get a range of situations to allow me to evaluate the film. For those, I've chosen four different scenes, which I feel like give a decent indication of how each film performs in different situations, like slightly underexposing or shooting in high dynamic range situations, as well as one with skin tones. 
I'll show you all the shots in a particular scene together, and then we'll zoom in and scan the shots side by side so you have a chance to study them in relation to each other. You can either just watch the video as I go through them all one at a time, or you can download the scans and study them yourself at your own leisure. But before we dive into the photos, I wanna give you a tool which will help you in your analysis. I've created a black and white film scorecard you can use to help you make decisions on the films. If you choose to use the scorecard, and, and this is important, I'm not actually going to give you access to my spreadsheet here to edit. If you want to use it, you're going to make a copy of it in Google Docs before you can edit it. Since not all of you will choose to use my scorecard, I don't wanna to spend too much time on it here in this video. I've tried to include some detailed instructions and descriptions of the various categories for scoring in the actual document itself, as well as some possible defaults. If you plan to download the photos and study them on your own time, you'll wanna to skip to the timestamp you see on your screen now. But for everyone else, let's look at some photos. So with the blind test out of the way, now comes the big reveal. Here are the names associated to the letters. Now, based on the data that I've collected here, I definitely have some recommendations for you on which films might work best for different styles of photography and different experience levels of shooters. With that in mind, I'm going to go through and analyze each film. 
I'm going to briefly mention a bit about the history of each emulsion, its unique and defining characteristics, and who might benefit from shooting with it. And at the very end, I'll conclude by telling you what my own personal film of choice is. We'll start with the cheaper, or what I would call the budget films. These films typically are used by students or budget conscious photographers. And weighing in at a pretty 359 per roll, the cheapest of all the films, but only available in North America, is Ultrafine Extreme. Ultrafine Extreme Film is retailed by Photo Warehouse out of Oxnard, California. But as to who produces this film and what its history is, Photo Warehouse isn't saying anything. This film to me is surprisingly high quality for one so cheap. It has medium contrast with good latitude and I'd say medium to fine grain, which seems consistent, smooth, and pleasant. The film is sharp, it retains great shadow detail even when underexposed. It is a flexible film and allows for a range of development errors and also is great for pushing. I have nothing to complain about with this film at all. Next up is Fomapan, which is also Arista ED Ultra, which is also Lamography Earl Grey, and who knows how many others. Fomapan has been produced by Foma, a Czech company, for almost 100 years. It's Europe's popular budget-friendly brand, and it gets repackaged by various and sundry brands on a regular basis. I've found that prices vary between various brands, so I'll usually watch and compare those prices and get the version which happens to be the cheapest at any given time. Currently in the US, Foma can be purchased for $4.59 per roll, which is much cheaper currently than buying the three pack of Earl Grey. However, one of its other incarnations, Arista EDU Ultra, can be purchased for 30 cents cheaper. But it's something to compare before ordering because those prices seem to fluctuate. Foma Pan has a lot higher contrast than the other films we're comparing. It has high edge detail, but conversely seems a bit more prone to elation than the others. I have two complaints about Foma Pan. First is the grain structure, which is very pronounced and is very chaotic or messy. The grain is not consistent from roll to roll and even on the same frame, leading to results that you just can't depend on. Additionally, Foma Pan seems to be less flexible when underexposed and seems to struggle retaining shadow detail. For those in North America, I can't recommend Foma Pan and its various incarnations since Ultrafine is cheaper and seems to me to be much more consistent and a higher quality film. For Europeans or elsewhere, it's most likely the best option for budget or educational photography. But even then, I would never recommend relying on this film for professional work or work you care a lot about. It's probably great for practice or experimentation when you're learning. Having said all that, the group I can handily recommend this film to are lamographers or photographers who are after that iconic film look, who want as little mistake as possible that they are hipstering it up old school style without any need for visco or hipstamatic or Instagram filters or whatnot. The next film I want to discuss is Harmon Ilford's FP4+. Plus. While not exactly a 100 speed film, its box speed is 125, this guy certainly would not be complete without it in the mix. This film is extremely old, having been through four major iteration, hence the four, since its creation in 1935. This film is known for being crazy versatile, able to be underexposed by two stops and overexposed by six. It makes it one of the most forgiving black and white films out there. At a current US price of $5.29 per roll, this film renders strikingly similar to Ultrafine Extreme, medium to high contrast, great sharpness, pleasant grain structure, and great shadow detail. And in spite of the apparent physical differences in the emulsions that I mentioned earlier, it makes me wonder if there's any truth to the rumors that um, these ultrafine films are actually Ilford films in disguise. If that is the case, for US film photographers, this is great news. We get the quality and flexibility of FP4, but in cheaper package. I highly recommend FP4 due to its versatility, palatable cost, and excellent rendering. The next two films I want to talk about are, from what I understand, quite affordable in Europe, but are exceedingly expensive in North America. At a not inconsequential 839 per roll in the US, the polyester-based Roli RPX100 brings a low contrast with broad tonal range, flat tone curve, and wide latitude option to the table. It does have slightly more pronounced and slightly chaotic grain structure to me, but it's sharp and it retains good shadow detail. But with the flat tonal curve, RPX is an excellent choice for modern film photographers who want as much flexibility as possible in post-production. With this film, you'll get optimal amount of control over the final tone curve. Our next film is Roli Retro 80S. It isn't a 100 speed film, but it but it's close enough that I felt I should include it in the guide. At a whopping 859 USD per roll, this is the most expensive of the films we're looking at in this guide. This is a very unique film that exhibits higher than normal contrast and has extremely high spectral sensitivity. While most of the other films we're discussing dry fairly flatly and are not hard to scan, especially as medium format, Roli RPX is extremely curly and unruly, but to those who send the film off to a lab to scan, this will matter not at all. 
We'll conclude with two films which are called T-grain films. Up to this point, we've been talking about classic cubic grain structure films, but a more modern development in film photography has been the T-grain emulsions. Without getting very technical, which you know I couldn't do even if I wanted to, I'll just say that T-grain film is uniform in its grain characteristics. It allows for grain which is more predictable, more even, and a lot less obvious than classic or cubic grains of the other films we've been discussing so far. T-grain is often compared to digital. It's preferred by those who don't like the grainy characteristics of most film. T-grain films are also more sensitive to variations in developer temperature, time, dilution, agitation, etc. They are going to be less forgiving than classic films. The first T-grain film we'll be discussing is Kodak T-Max. This film is very linear tonally and has low contrast, has very fine T-grain style grain, and is a good choice if you don't like grain. T-Max is supposed to exhibit high edge details, but for my tests, I felt like it was at best middle of pack when it comes to sharpness. And unless exposed for the shadow, it's likely that less shadow detail will be retained than some of the other films that we've been discussing. Many compare Delta 100 to T-Max, and while many will say it's not technically a T-grain film like T-Max, it uses similar technology and most just group them together as a T-grain emotion anyway. It is characterized by high sharpness, T-grain characteristics, wide latitude, linear tonality with medium to low contrast depending on the development. The results you'll get with Delta 100 are absolutely predictable, but it also commands a higher price at $6.09. Alright guys, well that was a lot of work and a lot of information. As I mentioned before, please take these results with a T-grain of salt since the results can vary immensely depending on how you develop and scan. But hopefully I've given you enough of a cursory view of these films to help you feel like you have a place to start shooting and experimenting. For me myself, uh, doing this guide has only solidified which is my favorite film and you've probably been able to guess what that is by now. It's certainly ultra fine extreme. Uh, while nothing will ever replace, for me, the beauty that was Acros 100 that Fuji just discontinued, knife to the heart, um, Ultrafine Extreme represents really good quality and uh, very in a very, very cheap package. Um, so that's going to be my, my film of choice, unless I'm shooting something professional or something where I, I just need the absolute best possible quality, in which case I'll reach for Delta 100, which has a more proven track record and um, seems to be more consistent across the board. So that's what I personally will use and what I'd recommend. However, all of these films are excellent by their own right and each of them has a place. And with that in mind, I would love to hear what the results were for you. Did you find a film you like? Please let me know in the comments. Otherwise, if you enjoyed this video and hope to see more film comparisons like it, please know that they represent a great deal of time and expense for me personally. I'd really appreciate any help you can provide. That can come by sharing it, subscribing, liking, all of that. But if you feel especially grateful, feel free to check out some of our merchandise or consider becoming a patron of the channel. All of this allows us to continue to bring content like this. In the meantime, keep smashing the shutter button, long live film, talk to you again real soon.